I have other sheep and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life and I take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the text. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Friends of our Lord and Good Shepherd, fellow disciples of Concordia, there is probably no more beloved image that offers our hearts comfort and hope than Jesus' promise to be our crucified and risen Good Shepherd. We picture him in our mind as our vigilant guardian watching over us as his contented flock, spending our lives tranquilly grazing in verdant pastures, idyllic lives undisturbed by harmful threats, blissfully happy, materialistically comfortable, not a care in the world. He has affirmed his identity as the Good Shepherd when he literally laid down his life, dying on the cross, buried in the grave, a sacrifice of heroic proportions, taking on wolves of sin, death, and the devil, the divine testament of his faithful love there on Calvary. He did not run away like some mercenary demagogue full of their egotistical self-interest or self-seeking rewards. Everybody abandoned him, but he was faithful to the responsibility the Father had given him to die for those lost sheep. Proving, therefore, he's not in this world for himself, but for us. Those sufferings, that death, that burial affirm the good news of how intent God is on always being with us. I am the good shepherd, I take up my life again, he says. A verbal description of his actual resurrection. The empty tomb revealing the good shepherd's enemies have been defeated. They are tried. They failed. They could not eliminate him. In fact, he turned the tables, and his resurrection says he has eliminated them. They're the losers, not him. The power of his love for us is this victory over wolfish predators that would harm our trust in him being our good shepherd under his care and concern. They might try to limit or threaten our expectation of his protection and his presence. The resurrection crucifies and kills all those doubts and uncertainties. Jesus declares whatever else we might want to know about him and how much we mean to him, no consequence compared to him being the good shepherd laying down his life, promising God will be with us. He says, you knowing that is like the knowledge that me and my father have in common. That's the icing on the cake. <clears throat> Trusting and hoping this good shepherd is not a quaint verbal metaphor, but his promise. We are under his personal proprietary care. A relationship so intimate and profound is like the divine rapport between God the Father and God the Son. This touches our hearts and is emotionally stirring, believing and anticipating that he's always going to be this. The foundation of whereby we can enjoy living faith and celebrate a lifelong discipleship. Jesus is the good shepherd, raised, crucified and raised. But then again, it is our sinful natures, too often vexed by our own mistakes and errors that cause us suffering and problems in our lives. Wondering if it also interrupts and interferes with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Then we start to think of the Good Shepherd. Well, Jesus kind of meant it in a figurative sense. He may have faced down the wolves on Calvary and defeated them on Easter. 
still hear them howling. Our sins stalk us. Others are lurking to take a bite out of their lives with their greed and their cruelties. And our old Adam and Eve rise up to protect. Good shepherd. Well, that's a pretty picture hanging on a wall, but it's not doing me much good. I still feel the pain, the loneliness. Scary conditions caused by natural disasters chew us up and spit us out. The feeling of how weak and helpless we are. Man-made debacles gnaw at us with ravenous appetites of fear and worry. And our fleshly instinct is to accuse this so-called good shepherd. I'm not doing a very good job because our materialistic cravings are not being satisfied. Our consumeristic urges are not being fulfilled. And then our consciences eat away at us for having doubted God as really being with us. Our suspicions lead us in our conscience to say, well, what does God really think about us now? If anybody felt that way about us, we'd probably turn our back on. Oh, little lambs. Jesus bids us cling to the promise that in those moments such as those, he'll reveal just how good a shepherd he is. Because we will hear his voice reassuring us he is with us. No, I am not referring to some inner voice which other versions of Christianity may refer. Supernatural, intriguing, paranormal, transcendental, as that all sounds. Let, G, let, let God talk to you. The Spirit will speak to you. Sounds like a bunch of overly enthusiastic feather munching to me. My preferred brand of faith inclines toward the confession, God be praised. A seven-year-old child knows what the church is. Holy believers and the little sheep who hear the voice of their shepherd. Those are my words. Those were spoken 500 years ago by Mark Luther. Thank God a seven-year-old knows what the church is. Those whose hearts continue to hear the voice of the shepherd speaking to them, speaking to his flock here this morning in the fold that is called Concordia on this fourth Sunday of Easter. The same way he spoke to his flock gathered in the upper room on that first Easter. Remember, Jesus came among them and led their hearts and minds to trust how the law, the prophets, and the Psalms of God's word all were leading to his person and work of dying and rising again. So faith in the good shepherd comes about and it increases when our trusting in him is not like Thomas, where seeing is believing, because Jesus specifically said and promised Blessed are those who believe but have not seen. We haven't seen him. <laughs> but we have heard him. As Paul's glorious response and affirmation, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Not a words about Christ, but the word of Christ. Sermons that are not morality lectures or motivational speeches on better ethics or more virtuous living or pep talks on the important not, importance of going out and loving others. How do you hear the voice of Christ crucified and raised in all that nonsense? The promise of Christ to every disciple of generations that have been and will ever be you will hear my voice when those words preached and taught inspire your heart to realize God, the Creator's love, and His merciful love for His fallen creation is revealed in God, the Word made flesh, who spoke over that creation into existence, is born in a manger, dies on a cross, raised from the grave, He's in the upper room after the resurrection and he continues to be in the midst of where two or three are gathered in his name. 
Jesus promises that when there is some part of the Bible salvation of history, God graciously forgiving towards Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or David or to their whole family of descendants, the nation of Israel, any Bible story or psalm or hymn or prophecy. Let it be so expounded that it inspires repentant joy that Jesus is God's incarnate promise, given unto death and risen from the dead, continuing to love the whole world and every broken heart and contrite spirit in it. And that's us. To hear the voice of the Good Shepherd graciously and mercifully reassuring his sheep. I'm still with you. Now, just to be clear, if you haven't gotten the message over the last three and a half months, that's what I've been trying to do every Sunday. People ask me, so, Pastor, how you doing? Before church. I'm nervous. This is the work that God gave me to do. Not to tell you how to live your lives, but to share with you how Jesus lived his and died and rose and now reigns for you. So nothing will ever separate or come between you and him. It's a scary thing. In fact, Martin Luther, who I mentioned before, had his own little sacristy prayer. It goes like this. This is what he would pray before he came out and preached. Lord God, you have appointed me as a bishop and pastor in your church. But you see how unsuited I am to meet so great and difficult a task. Therefore, I call upon you. I wish to devote my mouth and my heart to you. I shall teach the people. I myself will learn and ponder diligently upon your word. Use me as your instrument. But do not forsake me, for if I ever should be on my own, I would easily wreck it all. Amen. <laughs> Luther realizes rightly, preachers of the crucified and risen shepherd are promising they will use their mouths and hearts as the earthly instruments for communicating the shepherd's loving voice to his flock and reassuring them that he has not forsaken or abandoned them. Now as odd as all that may sound and mysterious as it is, how unlike from that which happens at the altar where Jesus calls pastors and their hands and feet to convey to you the very elements of bread and wine through which the good shepherd promises to embed his real presence in your heart. I'm just using these things at the altar. I'm just using this thing in the pulpit. There's only one thing that I would like to simply add, risking the chance of going a little long. Nathan Hale, famous Revolutionary War patriot, is known for having been caught as a spy by the British and facing the firing squad, spoke these famous last words, I regret that I only have one life to live for my country. Now there is the conundrum. The Son of God was given one life, incarnate by his birth, a life he lived in three years of ministry, a life that he then took to the cross and sacrificed, laid it down in the grave, and then took it up again on Easter. For all intents and purposes, it might seem like, well, you only had one, did the most with it. May I simply offer you this opportunity to reconsider. Yes, he did that. But because he did that, Jesus' words, when he says, I lay down my life and I take it up again, 
the connotation in which it can also be understood. I take my light and I set it where I want to set it, and I take it up. Nobody gets in my way. There's almost a bit of defiance here. I can put me anywhere I want. This morning we give thanks and praise again that the Good Shepherd has set himself in the midst of his flock in this place. And he has brought us together so he can take up his life with us. The beloved flock to whom he delegates the privilege of doing his will on earth, following in his footsteps, taking up our crosses of sacrificial service and loving others as he first loved us. He's the good shepherd. His death and resurrection promises he'll always be with us. We shall always be with him. He made us his own. He purchased us as members of his flock in holy baptism. Easter continues to bid us rejoice. You get to enjoy his companionship and each other's company all throughout the days of your lives on this earth until you and I and all of us enter into the eternal fold of everlasting everlasting life. With joy, with celebration, may we all get to the heavenly fold and may our hearts give thanks. Jesus, it's good to hear your voice. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.